So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today for our event. Um, Caroline was asking me, are we starting at 2.45 or are we starting at 3? And I had to explain that in Ireland we invite people for 2.45 to start at 3. And uh, then we both uh, remarked that it was a bit like climate targets. In Sweden, you know, if you have a climate target, you meet it. But in Ireland, if you have a climate target, you, you meet it, but you might meet it a little bit late. So um, anyway, thanks a million uh, for, for coming to the event. I just want to remind you to switch off your mobile phones. You, or sorry, not, you don't have to switch them off, but please switch them to silent. Uh, feel free to tweet, etc., uh, about the event at IIEA. Um, so um, I'd like to thank Phil, actually, for introducing us to today's speaker, um, who is Caroline Westblom. And welcome to Ireland, Caroline. You've been thank here you. for a few days, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, she managed to squeeze us into her busy schedule. Uh, Caroline works as an EU climate and energy policy coordinator at Cl uh, Climate Action Network, um, CAN Europe. And um, CAN is a very influential NGO in uh, the EU milieu, for those of you who haven't heard of it. Uh, it, it represents, it's an umbrella organization with approximately 150 member organizations from 35 countries representing 40 million citizens. Um, she's going to speak to us today on the topic of Ireland's climate and energy policy within a European context, a critical perspective, a bit of a sting in the tail there maybe. Um, and from chatting to Caroline before the event, we asked her would she, given her closeness to the EU policy developments, would she offer a perspective on where EU energy and climate policy developments are going? And seen from an EU and maybe perhaps a Swedish perspective, um, how you would see Ireland's climate policy performance within that EU context. And then finally, maybe looking forward at the integrated national energy and climate plans, you might also touch on those and what the implications might be for Ireland. Um, so without further ado, Caroline, I'll pass over to you and uh, you can speak from your table or from, uh, from the podium, whichever suits you. Sure. Um, no, I'll, I'll stay here. It's, okay. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, feels feels better. No, thanks. Thanks a lot, Joe, uh, for for inviting me and, and to to feel as well. Um, uh, it's uh, it's been a real pleasure to be in Ireland the last couple of days. Uh, like Joe said, we we we're based in Brussels, but we're a network organisation. So uh, our members are uh, national, well, European and international NGOs as well, but obviously based uh, all around Europe, not only in EU countries, but uh, but broader than that as well. Um, but obviously, um, and so what we're doing um, in, in Brussels as a secretariat is trying to influence uh, EU climate energy policy in a positive direction. Um, obviously, however, that is uh, very much dependent on what's going on at the national level. Because I was saying to the colleagues the other day, uh, what we often hear in Brussels is that, you know, in the member states, uh, in the capitals, uh, there is a tendency to want less Brussels, to want less uh, restrictions coming uh, from Brussels and Brussels to, to, to tell member states what to do. Uh, of course, however, reality is that Brussels is the member states. I mean, it is the 28 member states uh, and what they come together um, to, to develop and compromise on is ultimately what, uh, what is then going to be implemented on the national level. Um, so, uh, very excited to, uh, to come here today and talk about uh, EU's climate policy uh, and Ireland's role in that. I think it's a very um, good and critical time to come together to talk about this uh, this year, uh, this year of 2018, uh, because it is internationally, it is the year uh, to take stock, uh, to take stock of where we are in terms of uh, global action to mitigate climate change. Uh, once uh, the countries, all of the world's countries got together in Paris, uh, um, you know, with the unprecedented effort that we saw there to, to sign the Paris Agreement, um, they also recognized uh, that the goals that we set ourselves there uh, to pursue efforts to limit global warming to 1.5 was not going to be achieved with the pledges that were made ahead of Paris. That was formally recognized, and so uh, what they agreed was to come back in 2000, 2018 to take stock of where we are, uh, look at how big is the gap, um, and what will we now need to do to close it, so that we know later than 2020 um, can come back and make sure that we actually revise uh, those commitments that we made uh, pre-Paris. Um, so given that, it's of course also a very uh, good opportunity to um, zoom out uh, also in, in the EU, uh, uh, both zoom out and zoom in, uh, if, you, if you may, uh, on, on how things are going. Um, now, 
just, just for context, I mean, what, what was agreed in Paris, um, I, I call it an unprecedented effort to mitigate climate change, and it really is, uh, because what we agreed there um, to sort of advance the commitment that we had from before to limit warming to two degrees and actually pursue it to 1.5 will have um, a significant impact, or actually, maybe I should say, if we fail uh, to limit it to 1.5, uh, that will have um, significant impacts. Uh, just um, as one example, and it's, it's quite a, a terrifying one, um, that if we, if we limit warming to, uh, to 1.5 degrees, we might actually be able to save roughly 30% of the world coral reefs, or if you uh, put it the other way around, we will still lose 70% of them. But if we go to 2 degrees, we might actually as well lose all of them. Um, so that's how se severe uh, impacts there will be and, and, and the, the, the changes, the differences that we're, we're talking about. Um, in terms of, of, of the gap uh, of the Paris pledges, um, we indeed, uh, uh, the countries agreed to take stock this year, but we actually already more or less know how big of a gap we're talking about. Uh, the UNEP, United uh, Nations Environment Programme, in their emissions gap report last year said that the NDCs that were put forward before Paris cover roughly one third of the emission reductions that we need to undertake to deliver uh, even the two degree targets, one third. So basically, two-thirds of the emission reductions we need to undertake, they're still not being tackled. Um, now, going to the EU, um, the EU is at the moment uh, busy with turning its Paris pledge into legislation. That's good news, uh, because it is very few countries still in the world um, that are taking that step. I mean, all of them have committed, uh, they've made pledges to the Paris Agreement, uh, but haven't really sort of started to actually turn those into legislation. So the EU is advancing on this. This is very good. We are now coming to a very, um, to the end of a very long cycle um, of agreeing of new climate and energy policies for 2030. Actually, uh, the energy files, a renewable energy directive, energy efficiency directive, and the new governance regulation, they were um, adopted only last week. So it's really, really fresh. Um, however, these pieces of legislation are indeed based on uh, the pledge that the EU made to Paris, so which is uh, to uh, reduce emissions with 40% till 2040, um, 2030, sorry. Um, and this 40% uh, emissions reduction target is indeed part of that pot that I was exactly just referring to, that pot of inadequate uh, targets that are not enough to deliver Paris. Um, so, uh, it's clear that there's more that needs to be done. Uh, there was a report from the Oco Institute uh, just at the beginning of this year that said that you know if the EU would have to, um, if the EU would be able to to deliver on the two degree target, we would have to um, set ourselves a goal of 55 percent reductions instead of 40. Now, if we're looking at the 1.5 degree temperature goal, uh, we would be have to looking at something like 60 uh, to 65 percent. Um, that's clearly a lot more than 40 percent. Um, however, we do see some positive movements, and I'll start with that. So the recently agreed energy targets uh, for renewable energy and energy efficiency that were just adopted last week um, that were improved compared to the Commission's proposal. Um, uh, so we will now have a renewable energy target of 32.5%. No, yes, 32.5%. Uh, no, 32%, sorry. For renewable energy, 325 for, uh, for efficiency. Uh, and these two targets together uh, will de facto, if we implement them, of course, uh, take us to 45% emission reductions. Um, so what this clearly shows is that uh, the EU is able to go beyond uh, the target they have set themselves. Um, it also shows, however, that the EU keeps underestimating its potential uh, to do more, and it keeps setting unambitious targets because of that. Um, so it, that should be a clear um, signal going forward. Um, however, as I said, um, even this 45% reduction clearly would not be enough, and we would have to be, to be looking at much more. So therefore, going forward, it's still critically important that these um, emission reductions uh, that we can achieve with these newly agreed energy targets um, that we agree that they only um, you know, serve as a springboard uh, for actually agreeing uh, on these much more steeper emission reductions um, that we will have to see um, resubmitted to, to the Paris Agreement in 2020. Now, as I said, 
2018 is a year of taking stock um, internationally. So uh, we should also be doing this um, in Europe. So that's what we did uh, from our side, uh, from, from Can Europe side, uh, when we, a couple of weeks ago, we released a report, a ranking uh, of uh, EU member states' uh, performance uh, on climate action, uh, because we thought it isn't only, we cannot simply uh, you know, take the sort of uh, macro uh, perspective and only looking at uh, you know, where we're going uh, as the EU, because of course it is the member states of the EU that will have to deliver the EU target. The EU as such will not deliver a target. It is the member states that will have to deliver the target. Um, and we named the report of targets because unfortunately uh, the message is as clear as it's underwhelming. No country is doing enough uh, to deliver on the Paris Pledge. This is very clear. Um, however, there is a group of countries that have started to recognize um, exactly this, that uh, the target is too low, um, and we're also uh, not, not doing um, enough progress to, to reach it either. So, uh, and that, that group of countries, uh, it started as a group of seven uh, in, in April, uh, under the leadership of France, um, and with countries like Sweden, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Germany, Finland, and Portugal finally were the ones who joined it. Um, and it has uh, recently um, grown even further, but I'll come to that later. Now, I'm sorry to say Ireland is not part of that group uh, of countries that has uh, been calling for more ambition. And um, I don't know <laughs> so much about the Irish context. I'm not an expert on, on Irish national policy. Uh, but having followed uh, EU policy closely for, for a couple of years, uh, here is a couple of things that I know. <laughs> there are many ways in which you can design EU policy so that it looks nice and shiny on paper, so that it looks as if you will have no problems to reach your targets, um, but that in reality those targets actually don't have to be met through real action and through real emissions reductions on the ground, uh, but through the use of certain um, offsets or accounting tricks, etc. And so this is, uh, for example, in, in, in one very important piece of legislation that was um, uh, adopted at the end of last year. Uh, it was called something very unsexy as the effort sharing regulation. Luckily, they renamed it into the climate action regulation. Uh, which basically deals with emission reductions uh, in the sectors outside of the emissions trading scheme. So transport, agriculture, buildings, waste. And for those sectors, we have a target of 30%. Now, because of a certain amount of loopholes that have been enshrined into that legislation, uh, we, it's not at all sure that we will be delivering those 30%. Only 25% is actually going to uh, be ensured to be delivered through real uh, emission reductions. And so this is clearly unacceptable uh, in, uh, in the situation we're in with, uh, with runaway climate change and global targets not adding up to what we need to do. Um, so this is also, was also one of the criteria that we looked at in our report. You know, how are countries, what are country stands on, on these kind of issues and do they uh, take active participation in actually preventing these kind of loopholes and making sure that we are um, you know, taking real action and not using um, different kinds of accounting tricks uh, to just meet targets on paper. And um, here, uh, I have to say that the role of Ireland uh, has been not very constructive uh, in this particular debate, um, uh, on this particular piece of legislation, uh, where it is possible to, for example, use uh, forest offsetting to, to offset emissions in the agriculture sector. Um, uh, Ireland was uh, particularly keen on that, um, and so uh, on paper Ireland has a target of 30% emission reductions till 2030. Um, if you do add up all of these uh, loopholes that can be used, um, as little as 1% will actually have to be uh, made until 2030 compared to 2005. Um, so that's 1%, not 30%, 1%. Um, and there are a couple of other examples as well. Uh, during, the, during the negotiations on the emissions trading scheme, which was um, taking place a bit, bit earlier, um, some of you, uh, many of you might know that uh, the, the carbon market we have in Europe has been crumbling for a long time. 
has been suffering for, from uh, way too low carbon prices, so it's not driving the emission reductions that we wish uh, it would do uh, in, in the industrial sectors. And so it was put up for reform um, and a couple of quite important um, uh, ambitious proposals were put on the table uh, to make sure we remove allowances from the carbon market and therefore um, uh, you know, we sort of force, force the price to go up. Uh, and this was also something that Ireland was against, um, which of course uh, did not help uh, the political debate. And in the recent uh, negotiations on the clean energy package uh, that I just mentioned have just been closed, um, the European Commission proposed a renewable energy target uh, for the EU uh, for 2030 to be 27%. Um, now that target, basically the moment it came out, it was heavily criticized not only by the NGO community, but by business, by industry, um, by uh, international organizations such as IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Federation, saying that uh, basically this target is business as usual. Um, given the, the rate of deployment that we've had for renewable energy uh, in Europe, uh, it would actually even stagnate the renewable energy uh, development and we would lose jobs in the renewable energy sector if we stick to this target. Uh, and we would have to go to a target of at least 35 to 45%. Um, so that was quite clear. Um, and nevertheless, um, Ireland was not willing uh, to accept uh, that the target should be higher than 27%. Um, it was only, I think, in the very last uh, Energy Council in June uh, that, that uh, some willingness was shown to, to move further um, uh, on this topic. So um, this list <laughs> can be made long, uh, unfortunately. Um, I'm sorry to say that. Obviously, Ireland is not the only country doing this. Let's be clear. Uh, it is... Um, an issue that we face in EU policy making that uh, when we have an EU-wide target that will need to be met and you know, individual member states will have to contribute to that target, it is clear that uh, the dynamics aren't always good. <laughs> Some will always want to make sure that their neighbour is doing more than themselves. Um, and what we are hearing also uh, from those countries and what I've been hearing from, from the Irish government in Brussels um, is, uh, would indeed be that, um, that Ireland would be a special case. Um, and I do understand and, and when we do know that uh, reducing, for example, emissions in the agriculture are difficult. It is difficult. Um, however, uh, it is also difficult in the transport sector. Um, and, and Germany, my own country like Sweden, who has uh, very nicely set goals uh, are facing enormous troubles reducing emissions in the transport sector. So does Luxembourg, uh, which is also a country that promotes uh, further climate action in the EU. So um, all countries have, have their difficulties. Um, however, what we do know and, and what we see is that the further we delay action, the more expensive it will get. Um, take the uh, example of the agriculture sector. Some colleagues of us um, in, in Brussels um, did a little calculation on if we would if you would make use of all the loopholes that we allow uh, for to offset uh, emission reductions in the in the agriculture sector, uh, the sector would have to take as much as up to nine times steeper reductions after 2030, going to 2050, if we are to reach our long-term goals. Um, that doesn't really sound like cost-effective pathway to me. So, um, actually, uh, delaying this kind of action um, isn't uh, isn't uh, beneficial. And at the same time, the co-benefits uh, of taking actions in the sectors uh, compared to, or in addition to, to the climate benefits um, are, are many, as we know, in terms of uh, um, health, um, reduced air pollution, etc. So the message that I take away from this is that we cannot, clearly we cannot afford this kind of race to the bottom uh, approach that, that we have seen in Europe uh, in the last couple of years. And that's why... I am happy uh, that, that we do see this, this recent movement uh, in the member states uh, with the groups of countries coming together, calling for more action, uh, even though they're facing difficulties uh, implementing some of the targets at home, because it's uh, about reality checking, I would say, uh, facing the science uh, of the climate crisis that we really still need to do more. And uh, earlier this week, uh, I, I mentioned before that this group of seven was, was growing, and it was indeed, so earlier this week, it was on Monday, 
uh, the so-called Green Growth Group of ministers um, came together and they released a statement uh, at the Environment Council on Monday uh, where they uh, came together and they uh, made a very clear call on the European Commission to come forward with a new uh, long-term climate strategy, which they have been uh, appointed to do by, by, by the heads of state, which is truly Paris compliant. So very clearly saying they have to look at the 1.5 degree pathway uh, and on the other hand, they also have to um, take a real serious look at revising the 2030 target as well um, and uh, looking to announce uh, such a revision at uh, the COP this year in Katowice in Poland. Um, however, the Green Growth Group consists of 16 member states and only 14 signed. Uh, one was uh, Austria, who has the incoming presidency and probably therefore was reluctant to sign. Uh, and the second one, uh, for unknown reasons to me, uh, was Ireland. Um, however, the other piece of good news, and, and that will be my final point, uh, is indeed that uh, with the adoption of the clean energy package uh, of last week, uh, we are entering into, according to me, a very exciting phase <laughs> uh, in, in EU climate and energy policy making, in the sense that one of the new requirements upon EU member states, as compared to uh, the current uh, period of, of legislative uh, files that we have until 2020, uh, countries will now have to develop uh, so-called integrated national energy and climate plans. Um, and the word integrated is what is interesting here and what is new, uh, because until now, uh, the EU climate and energy policy monitoring, planning, reporting, scheme is very complex. Um, if, uh, if anyone ever tells you that Brussels is just one big bureaucratic exercise, they're probably right, uh, because only in the, in the climate and energy policy sphere, uh, countries have over 50 different uh, planning and reporting and monitoring obligations uh, that they have to fulfill, um, which is obviously not, probably not very efficient. Um, so within this new uh, regime, they have to do these integrated climate, um, energy and climate plans, which will have to be 10-year plans, and which will have to look at, in an integrated way, uh, how to deal with the energy transition and tackling climate change in the country. And so that is what's exciting to me and to us, um, that in many countries where, um, where we face challenges in certain sectors, it is also to a large extent due to the fact that um, we tend to do policy making in silos. Uh, we tend to deal with environmental issues in the Department for Environment, and we tend to deal with um, you know, uh, everything that is with grid development and grid infrastructure in the Department for Energy, and they might not necessarily talk to each other. Um, and so that's why uh, we see a lot of potential in this new scheme to tackle some of the real challenges that member states are facing. Um, and within this new scheme uh, and this framework, uh, it's basically two things that, that countries will have to do. They will have to, on the one hand, state the targets and objectives um, that they um, have uh, for 2030 and beyond. Um, as you might know, within the agreed renewable energy directive and energy efficiency directive, there will be no more national binding targets for countries. We will have EU binding targets, um, which member states will have to meet somehow, uh, without having a national target. So they will have to pledge towards this target, basically. It's a bit similar to the Paris Agreement approach. Bottom up, you pledge, we see where we go. The difference is, of course, here we have a binding EU target to live up to. Um, so they will have to do that on the one hand in the plan, state how much they will uh, contribute. Uh, but then on the other hand, and I think this is what's this really important, they also have to come forward with very detailed policy plans uh, for how to actually they plan to meet these targets. Uh, and, and for us, this is critical, and uh, also in, in reference to what I said about potential loopholes earlier, um, for us, this is clearly a, uh, also an issue of, of transparency, and so that you know, uh, civil society and, and stakeholders will be able to take a close look at these plans and see that the policies that are put in place are actually robust, um, and the targets will be met with real action um, and not the use of loopholes. So, uh, it's clear we're still not on track to, to deliver our, our international uh, climate goals, uh, but um, the, uh, while the challenges have never been so great, I think neither has the opportunities. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.